what are your top 10 favorite pens? And I get asked about this time of time. Usually it's like a top five or top three or my favorite pen ever, that kind of thing. Uh, this is top 10, so I feel like, okay, I, I, at this point, honestly, I have, I think, over 400 pens. So I, uh, I very much have a pen, very much have a pen problem, everybody. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> my name is Brian and I have a pen problem. Uh, but I made a list, okay, it's 10, and I will say, like, it's not in order. I didn't, like, think about it like, oh, yeah, this is definitely my top 10 list. Um, because, honestly, they're all, like, my children. I love all my pens. I very much am a, an acquirer slash accumulator slash hoarder of pens. I love them, and I have a huge pen cabinet over here filled with pens, and I never get rid of any of them. Uh, that's part of my uh, obsession slash addiction. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. Well, sort of. Uh, so as far as like my favorites, okay, I made a top 10 list of like t 10 of like the kind of my favorite slash more uh, uh, meaningful pens to me. It is not an exhaustive list. Like I have more than 10 pens that really mean something to me and are really important, have been uh, th pens that I really, really like or um, you know, ones that are uh, particularly meaningful in like the development of the Goulet Pen Company and, and my own personal kind of uh, growth and stuff like that. So there are gonna be pens left off of here that, I, that are meaningful to me that won't be on this list. So forgive me if I leave any off, particularly if there are any manufacturers or vendors watching that I represent that are gonna feel disappointed the fact I didn't say theirs was the best. Um, it's, it's okay, I love seriously all the pens that I carry, but um, some ones that are just kind of worth me talking about. Um, of course, I have my Blue Pilot Custom 74. Uh, at this point now, it's more just like kind of iconic and representative of kind of who I am and what I do, but it's, you know, it's a blue pen, which I love. It was my first gold nib pen, uh, and I love the way that it writes. I did many, many, I mean, literally thousands of the earliest uh, handwritten thank you notes for the Gouli Pen Company was done with this pen. So it's well broken in, uh, and it's well broken in through writing notes of gratitude to our earliest customers that helped to get this company off the ground. So that, uh, if if nothing else, is why this pen is so meaningful to me. Um, but I also really just like the way that it writes. Uh, Lamy 2000, this is more of just kind of a practical one. This was like one of the one of the first gold nib pens I had. Um, it's, it's also very kind of iconic uh, and I love the design, the style of it. Uh, it might have been my first piston. No, my Noodlers was my first piston fill pen, but anyway. Uh, the Pilot Vanishing Point is another one. Uh, this is the Twilight, which uh, we don't have any more of, but it was a special edition. Uh, limited edition, sorry. And uh, I really just, I'm a big fan of the Vanishing Point. Uh, I have a matte black one that I use uh, actually more than this one, but I, the Twilight one is I really love. Really love the style of this one. Uh, the ombre look, but the vanishing point is a very kind of iconic and important pen to us here and to me personally. Uh, the Edison Nouveau Premier, this is the latest one, the Mystical Myrrh, uh, so it's not this particular one necessarily, but it's more just the pen in general. Uh, the Premier really represents a, an ongoing relationship that we've had with Edison Pen Company. Um, if we had not helped to design this pen together, um, you know, maybe uh, Edison would not have gone the route of making production line pens because this was the first production line pen that Edison had ever done. And I definitely will uh, selfishly take credit for um, kind of pushing Brian Gray in that direction. He was kind of already thinking about the idea anyway, but it was very much like our kind of our collaboration that was like we wanted to encourage him to do that. And so this pen is an exclusive that we've had for almost five years now. Um, and this is the latest of our seasonal editions. Um, that's why I have that handy, uh, but that pen really kind of represents a lot as well as far as like how m much we've grown uh, in Goulet pens. Uh, I have to have a Visconti in here because that is also kind of a benchmark for us, you know, getting into some more of the luxury brands. Omos was really kind of like more what I consider our first luxury brand, um, but Visconti was one that we had pursued for three or four years. And just this year we made that relationship happen. And of course their iconic pen is the Homo Sapiens. Uh, and the pen is just made of freaking volcano. So that is just really, really cool. Love the way that it writes. It's a vacuum filler, which I also dig totally. And I really like the hook safe lock that they have on this pen and the Davina. And the Davina is another you know, top pen, but uh, I didn't have, didn't have it on this list. Uh, but also very cool. Also kind of what it represents is kind of like a new, a new opportunity, a new relationship we sparked with them. 
I have the Monteverde Invincia Nighthawk. And this is a several years discontinued pen. It was only available for a very short period of time, um, but it was a collaboration that we did with uh, Monteverde. Uh, it was an exclusive pen. It's a matte black uh, satin uh, carbon fiber pen, or matte carbon fiber, what do you want to call it? Um, so it's like a completely stealthed out pen, black nib and everything. And uh, honestly, it's, uh, it's just, I, I had a hand in the design, so it was kind of like I got to help come up with it. Um, had some manufacturing issues. We were not able to continue to make it, but I still love that pen. It's got a special place in my heart. Uh, next one I have my three for a loop a little bit. Uh, the Noodler's Ahab, actually. Noodler's in general, like for those of you that have been around in the fountain pen world for uh, five years or more, there was a time when you really couldn't get a flex pen. It just was not something that many people had. Uh, and I very much attribute Nathan Tardif and the Noodler's uh, pens to the fact that flex nibs are now much more commonplace. So um, you're seeing other pen companies coming out with more uh, soft nibs and flex nib options um, because people want it and it's much more uh, popular now than it used to be. Um, which honestly has sparked a lot of creativity and interest in writing in general. So uh, uh, the Ahab wasn't the first, the first of the pens to come out, but uh, it's personally of the Noodler's pens, it's the one that I enjoy writing with the most. My hands are a little larger and I find it to be uh, really the most kind of reliable and best all around performing for the Noodler's pens. Um, so that's why I chose the Ahab, but really it's kind of more just the Noodler's pens in general are particularly meaningful, not just to me and what Noodler's has done to help Goulet, Goulet grow over the years, but really we should all be thanking Noodler's and Nathan Tardif specifically for not only the inks he's done, but kind of pushing that envelope and coming up with an affordable flex pen that has really honestly had quite an influence on writing over the last couple of years. The next one I have, we're really getting super meaningful now. Next one I have is um, this one, which is actually a ballpoint. And don't go flipping the channel or shutting off the YouTube video or whatever you want to say. Um, this is the first pen that I ever made. Um, and it really was what started the Goulet Pen Company. So this pen, it's not that great. Uh, it's pretty bad as far as how it's made and it's now got some cracks and stuff that have happened over time because I didn't use the right wood and I made it wrong and all this kind of stuff. But um, the, the backstory of Goulet pens is I started out at, on a whim making pens out of wood on a lathe, hand turning them, and that ended up turning into, you know, doing corporate gifts and stuff like that, which we then tried to roll into fountain pens, ended up not making pens anymore, but now we retail fountain pens. So if we had not first started making pens like this, there's no way I would have ever gotten into fountain pens. Not like I have. So essentially the Goulet Pen Company would not exist without my making, you know, this pen and just immediately being like, oh my gosh, this is cool. And that sparking of that initial passion that I had making this pen that now carries forward into what I do today. Next one I have, boy, I really got deep on some of these. Now I'm gonna get a little less deep, um, just the Pilot Metropolitan, huge fan of it. This is one of the um, newest ones, the Retro Pops, uh, which this color is my favorite of the bunch. Uh, the Metropolitan has equally been kind of influential. Uh, it's a $15 pen, writes fantastic, and it's been easily one of the best go-to uh, new pens for people getting into it. And I wish, you know, had I, there's so many pens now that it's like, dang, I really wish these had been around when I first got into fountain pens, but I'm kind of glad that they weren't, you know, like the Metropolitan and the Noodler's pen and stuff like that. It's like, you know, I actually really appreciate uh, these pens now, having them out now remembering when they weren't around because I super appreciate what they are now. Um, so that is, uh, that's where that one comes from. And then the last one, this is gonna be a bit of a curveball. I've actually never really talked about this pen yet. Um, but this is actually a, this is kind of more of a forward thinking, perhaps something on the horizon. Um, but this is the Pilot um, Yukari, or sorry, not Pilot, Namiki, uh, Yukari Nightline Moonlight. And this is made by Shinsai Sakamoto, who is a, a Makie artist uh, for Namiki, and uh, he's got his own um, signature down here. He he made this pen, and uh, it's a it's an Makie pen. So it's Yurushi lacquer and abalone shell, 
And uh, these are all individually placed pieces of abalone. And I should probably zoom in for this one because this one is pretty cool. Um, handmade Yerushi lacquer, it's fairly heavy pen. And this is the kind of stuff that we are considering possibly getting into in the near future. Um, when we went down to see Pilot USA uh, in November, definitely that was on the docket was to talk about these, um, you know, really, really fantastic pieces of art, honestly. Um, the great writing pens, of course, um, like all the Pilot Namikis are. Um, but really, it's the artistry and the craftsmanship that make these pens so special. Very, um, you know, they are, they're priced accordingly, given the amount of time and effort that it takes to make these pens. Um, but this is one that I uh, acquired while I was down in Pilot, and it kind of represents perhaps a new foray into something. And, you know, honestly, uh, when we went down there, you know, we got a chance to uh, talk to, you know, this, the, the president of Pilot USA. Uh, as well as a couple other, you know, fairly higher up people. And the, the thing that I pulled out of my experience there, and I haven't, I haven't gotten the video done of the pilot tour, uh, pilot USA tour, uh, I'm still working on it, been a little busy, and I apologize for not having that done yet. But um, the, the main thing that I pulled out of that visit was just seeing the scale at which pilot pens in general operates. A lot of which is ball points and roller balls, you know, G2s, the Acro Ball, and Pilot Precise, and things like that. Um, and so we went down there, just little Brian and Rachel, a little mom and pop, and we went there and we saw this huge facility. And we were just like, "What are we doing here? Why are we here? You know, what what relationship is there for them to really kind of build with? Just we are such a small piece of the pie in terms of Pilot in general." I think the G2 represents something like 60% of the rollerball market in the US, you know, so they're massive. Um, but uh, basically what, what they told us, what Pilot told us is that their Machia, um, you know, this is a technique that goes back to the, the 7th century in Japan. And um, their heritage, the tradition legacy is really important in Japan. And essentially, Pilot, they're, they're going to be coming up on their 100th year here fairly soon. Um, and the Machia techniques and the pens that they make essentially is like their history, their heritage. So even though that's not the mainstay of their business financially, it's kind of like their soul. So they, they view the passion that we have, what we share day in and day out with the videos and the way we service you all and kind of the way that we can story tell, they see that we can help to kind of carry on that tradition, that heritage that really is their soul. So I was like, well, dang, well, that's kind of cool. Okay, so, I mean, we're not, we're not going crazy and it's not like, I know you could easily look at what we've been doing recently and I'm getting away a little bit from the question now that was originally asked, but it's still important for me to talk about. I know it's easy to look and say, well, geez, Brian, you got all these golden pens here. They're so expensive and all that, but I want to make it very clear. I have not forgotten my roots. Like, the first year of the Goulet Pen Company, we didn't even sell pens. All we sold was ink and paper. So we have very much come from the grassroots, and I never forget that. I have and use plenty of Safaris and Metropolitans, Pilot Varsities, you know, Preppies, all that kind of stuff all day long. Uh, and now it's to the point where, okay, yes, I do have access to some of the, you know, higher end brands and, um, it's easy. It's, it would be easy for me to get really, you know, luxury drunk on some of these expensive pens, you know, dealing with things like Visconti and Namiki and some of this stuff. I could very easily be like Metropolitans or whatever, but that's not the case at all. I appreciate the full spectrum. And that, that kind of helps me being like the pen hoarder that I am. I have them all and it's like, I remember what it's like. Literally every time I get a question of somebody that's, that's new to fountain pens and all this stuff, I remember the struggle that it was for me. I didn't have anybody like me out there shooting videos like this to answer questions and put stuff out there and educate and stuff like that. I mean, I got a good start on the Fountain Pen Network. A lot of good folks helped me out there. Some of the information was maybe not as helpful coming from various sources. There were some bloggers and stuff like that out there, 
but it was not nearly what it is these days. Um, you know, with like me and like Stephen Brown, Matt Armstrong, you know, Dan Smith, Fountain Pen Geeks, um, you know, lots of other Aziza. Oh gosh, I don't want to leave anybody out. I didn't mean to start naming everybody, but um, you know, lots of other good folks. Please forgive me if I leave you out. Liz Steele. Ah, I keep naming names. Okay, sorry. Um, but anyway, so lots of good folks out there now that are doing kind of this good education thing. I didn't have that. So I remember what it was like to not know a friggin' thing. Uh, and still there's a part of me that's like every video that I make, I'm like, dang it, I just want to help people to know more so they don't have to figure it out the hard way like I did. Uh, but anyway, so that's where I'm at. So that's my, that's my, I'm going to wrap up this question because I could talk all day long. So that is, that is uh, my top 10, at least as of the moment. Um, it's going to be fluid. It could always change for sure um, because you know, clearly like the pens that I'm talking about like have a lot more meaning than may maybe you even realize or that I can talk about for forever. Moving on. 